So let us begin. So a warm good evening to all of you. So today I would uh, like to discuss with you about some strange words in our solar system. If you are someone who likes to travel a lot, uh, you might have got the experience that at some places you would feel very much like home, very much comfortable. Whereas at some other places, the things would be distinctly different. The conditions will be totally uh, different from what you are used to or what is existing at your native place. So such sort of places exist in what we experience on our planet Earth. So such worlds we call as unearthly worlds, which means not like Earth. So here I'm showing an overview of the solar system. You can see the sun, the eight planets, and the regions like the Cupia belt and the Oort cloud. If you look into the planets in the solar system, you can very easily notice that there is a significant difference in sizes when you compare the outer planets with that of the inner planets. So the eight planets in our solar system clearly classifies into two groups, namely the terrestrial planets and the Jovian planets. So the terrestrial planets includes the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And the Jovian planets include Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So apart from the sizes, there are several parameters in which there exist differences between these two group of planets. So here I have uh, shown a table in which the different properties of these two groups are compared with each other. The most significant difference between the two groups of planets is in their composition. This inner planets are mainly composed of rocks and metals, or we say they are generally rocky planets. Whereas if you look into the Jovian planets, they are primarily composed of the gases, hydrogen, helium, and hydrogen compounds. So by hydrogen compounds, I mean those molecules which contain hydrogen as an element. For example, a methane. So methane is CH4, isn't it? So hydrogen is there. Again, ammonia, NH3, again, hydrogen comes. Uh, then water, H2O. So all these are hydrogen compounds. So the Jovian planets are primarily composed of the gases like hydrogen, helium, and the hydrogen compounds. So since they are composed of this lighter gases, their densities are lesser as compared to the terrestrial planets. So the terrestrial planets, as I said before, are composed of heavy rocks and metals because of which they are having a higher density. So Jovian planets has got a lesser density as compared to the terrestrial ones. Also, they are far away from the, uh, from the sun and also far away from each other. So in short, we can say the Jovian planets are those planets which lies at the outer region of the solar system. They are enormous in size, are composed mainly of the gases, hydrogen, helium, and hydrogen compounds, and hence have a lower density and also they are farther away from the sun and farther away from each other as well. So now the question is why this sort of two kind of composition exists in the planets uh, within our solar system. You might have already learned from the previous speakers that all the planets formed from the same solar nebula, which is solar nebula is nothing but uh, just a cloud of uh, dust and gas. So if every planet formed from the same solar nebula, why this sort of uh, difference is existing in the composition? Let us understand. So the main reason for this difference in the composition is the fact that the Jovian planets formed at a larger distance from the sun. So let us look into uh, the planetary formation process. So this planetary formation starts, as I said before, from the solar nebula. The particles of the solar nebula starts solidifying through a process called condensation. And this solidified particles gradually grows in size with time until the gravity starts pulling it together into a planet. So whatever that is the ingredient or the content of the solar nebula is what you should be finally seeing in the planet. So here I am showing a table in which I have listed the ingredients of the solar nebula. The nebula is primarily composed of the gases, hydrogen and helium which constitutes about 98% of the total mass of nebula. The second dominant constituent is the hydrogen compounds, which as I said before, includes H2O, CH4, and uh, methane, ammonia, uh, sorry, uh, ammonia, NH3. 
and the hydrogen compounds constitutes about 1.4 percentage and the remaining portion is constituted by rocks and metals and these two components together constitutes only less than 1 percentage of the total mass of the solar nebula so it is with the condensation of these ingredients of the solar nebula that we finally got the planets in our solar system but the thing is that this hydrogen and helium gas in the nebula can never condense because they requires extremely low temperatures for the condensation to occur and such sort of low temperatures no not existing in our nebula so this means that this hydrogen and helium stayed in the form of gases itself within the nebula whereas the other three ingredients of the nebula can uh, condense whenever the temperature is appropriate so the metals condense at relatively high temperatures of 1000 to 1600 kelvin and rocks require a little bit lower temperature for condensation to occur and the hydrogen compounds uh, condense at extremely low temperatures of around 150 kelvin now if you look into the solar system you can see that at region close to the sun the temperatures are really high which is obvious isn't it because sun is a very hot body and those regions which lies closest to the sun will obviously uh, be at higher temperatures but as you go farther and farther away from the sun the temperature gradually decreases so you can imagine a border line between the planets mars and jupiter so this border line is usually referred to as the frost line or the snow line in the region within this frost line or snow line a uh, snow line that is very close to the sun because of which the temperature in this region is very high so that planet asimals from which the planet formation occurred within this region formed was mainly from rocks and metals because at these higher temperatures only these two ingredients of the solar nebula could condense and these two ingredients as i said before constitutes only a very small fraction of the nebula and hence the planet asimals from which these planets were formed were of very small in size and finally ended up as the small sized terrestrial planets but the scenario was different at those regions beyond the frost line because at this region the temperature is very low the temperature is low enough for the hydrogen compounds to also condense in addition to the rocks and metals so again as i mentioned previously the hydrogen compounds constitute a larger fraction of the solar nebula as compared to the rocks and metals so this means that the planet asimals from the planet asimals from which the uh, giant planets formed in this particular region of the solar system were much more massive as compared to the planet asimals from which the terrestrial planets formed so more massive means they are having a very high gravity and what happens when the gravity is very high it would be able to capture a large amount of materials from the surroundings so this planet asimals were so massive that they captured a large amount of hydrogen and helium gases from the surrounding solar nebula and these hydrogen and helium gases are very light and when a gas is very light the thing is that it would be able to easily escape uh, the gravitational pull of a planetary body so that is why you don't get to see hydrogen and helium gases much in the inner planets but in the case of outer planets the gravitational pull was so high that even these lighter gases couldn't escape from these planets so finally these planets asimals ended up as the giant planets with a, a gas mass surrounding it and interestingly this giant planets do not have a solid surface unlike the case of terrestrial planets so on earth we have a solid surface isn't it so that is where we stand on but in case of this giant planets that sort of a solid surface is not there so giant planets are basically like you have a planetary core which is composed primarily of the hydrogen compound rocks and metals where the hydrogen compounds is uh, constituting a larger fraction and this core is surrounded by a swirling mass of gas so now i hope you understood why we have this sort of uh, two kind of composition among the planets in our solar system now the question is again whether uh, all the four planets in the uh, uh, outer solar system are similar in composition that is as i said before again we have four planets four planets within the jovian category so whether all these four planets having the same composition no it is not so so if you look into the jovian planets itself you can see that uh, 
Jupiter and Saturn are much larger in size as compared to Uranus and Neptune. In terms of composition also, they, there are differences. The Jupiter and Saturn, we usually refer to as gas giants based on its composition because they are primarily composed of the gases hydrogen and helium. Whereas Uranus and Neptune, we usually refer to as the ice giants. So ice giants because, as I said before, their planetary, uh, I mean, planetary core contains a large fraction of the hydrogen compounds. And these hydrogen compounds are in the condensed form. And in the condensed form, we refer to these hydrogen compounds as ices. So that's why Uranus and Neptunes are considered as ice giants. So within the Jovian planet itself, you have two subcategories based on its composition. The first one is the gas giants, which includes Jupiter and Saturn, which is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium. And the second category is the ice giants, which includes Uranus and Saturn, which again is composed by uh, uh, the hydrogen compounds along with rocks and metals. So you will find something interesting if you look into the density of these planets. So I'm talking about density because we, were, we are discussing about the composition and the composition is ultimately what determines the density of a material, isn't it? So what is density? So density is nothing but mass per unit volume. And it is this particular parameter which decides whether a body will float or sink if you put it into a liquid like water. So water is having a density of one gram per centimeter cube. So if the density of the body is greater than that of one gram per centimeter cube, it will sink in water. Otherwise, it would flop. So here I have shown a chart in which the density of the different planets in our solar system are uh, indicated. As you can see, the terrestrial planets are having a higher density, which is obvious because they are composed of heavy rocks and metals. But the Jovian planets are having a lower density because they are made of lighter elements like hydrogen and helium. And among the Jovian planets, Saturn is the one which is having the least density. Density of Saturn is even less than that of 1. That means if you can find a water body which is large enough to hold our planets, and if you put Saturn into it, the Saturn will float. So now uh, we discussed so far uh, about how we had two different types of composition and how we categorize the planets into two groups based on this composition. And uh, our focus is on the Jovian planets. So now I would like to discuss about some interesting features of this Jovian planets, which makes us makes them very intriguing bodies in our solar system. So one such feature is their ring system. So whenever you get to see a picture of Saturn, you will always notice this beautiful ring system around it. So it is hard to even imagine Saturn without its ring system. Actually, not only Saturn, all the other three Jovian planets also has got this ring system. But they are not very thick or shiny as the Saturn's rings. So that is why they are not very easily detectable. And this ring system looks like a solid sheet from Earth. But actually, it is not a single solid sheet. It consists of many consecutive rings which are separated from each other by narrow gaps. And these consecutive rings are composed of small pieces of rocks and ices which goes around the planet like tiny satellites. Now let us understand how this ring system forms around this uh, Jovian planets. The main reason for the formation of the ring system is the enormous gravity of these planets. As I said in the beginning, these Jovian planets are very gigantic because of which they are having a very large gravity. And there is something called Roche's limit. So Roche's limit is the distance from a planet within which if you put another celestial body, such as a small satellite within this region, the gravitational pull that is experienced by the celestial body from this parent planet will be enormously high so that it will disintegrate itself into small bits and pieces. And this bits and pieces will finally start going around the planet, uh, ultimately flattening into a disk. So this is how the terrestrial planets develop a ring system. And sorry, Jovian planets develop a ring system. And so again, so why terrestrial planets are not having a ring system is because of the fact that they are small in size. So this is because of which they are having a lower gravity and hence a ring system did not form around them. So that was about the ring system. Now coming to the satellite system. 
So again, if you look into the terrestrial planets, you can see that we only have three satellites within the inner planetary system. So one is our Earth satellite, which is Moon. Then Mars has got two satellites named as Phobos and Deimos. But this is not the case if you look into the Jovian planets or the giant planets. Currently, we know around 280, more than 285 satellites for all the Jovian planets. And the Jupiter and Saturn are the one having a large number of satellites. Each of them has got more than 60 satellites. So here I have listed some of the uh, prominent satellites of the Jovian planets. The first four shown over here are the satellites of Jupiter. These four are usually referred to as the Galilean satellites because they were discovered by the scientist Galileo. And each of this body has got its own interviewing features. For example, if you look into Io, so Io is the most geologically active body in our solar system. So there are a large number of volcanoes on the surface of Io and the eruptions in these volcanoes are so frequent. And coming to Europa, Europa is an icy world. It consists of an icy shell. And now the scientists are almost sure that there is a very large ocean of water beneath this icy shell. So this body Europa has become so intriguing that now NASA is going to have an exclusive mission for studying Europa. The mission is named as Europa Clipper mission and it is going to be uh, launched in coming October. That is October 2024. Then Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest satellite in our solar system. And coming to the satellites of Saturn, there is a very interesting body called Titan. So Titan is the largest satellite of the planet Saturn and the second largest satellite in our solar system. And the interesting feature of the Titan is that it is the only satellite in our solar system which has got a thick atmosphere. Its atmosphere is even thicker than that of Earth's atmosphere. And in addition to the atmosphere, it has got many other interesting features like uh, there occurs uh, volcanic eruptions, tectonic activities, uh, then wind, uh, methane cycle is there, liquid body, bodies are detected on the surface of Titan and all that. So each and every satellite in our solar system, I know in the uh, outer region of our solar system are very intriguing bodies. They have many features which are similar to those of a planet, but because of their small sizes, they are considered as satellites only. Now the next aspect of the Jovian planets, which uh, I would like to touch upon is their atmospheres. So all the four uh, Jovian planets has got very thick atmospheres. And these atmospheres are primarily composed of the gases, hydrogen and helium, with a uh, considerable fraction of the hydrogen compounds as well. So Jupiter and Saturn almost has got similar composition, with the difference that in Saturn, the, the abundance of helium is lesser as compared to Jupiter. Whereas in case of Uranus and Neptune, Hydrogen and helium itself are the abundant compounds, but there is a higher abundance of hydrogen compounds, especially methane, as compared to the uh, gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. So even though methane constitutes only a minuscule fraction of this atmosphere, it is this particular gas which is responsibly, I mean, virtually responsible for, for almost all aspects of its physical appearance. So if you look into Uranus and Neptune, you will always notice that they appear in shades of blue. So this occur because of the presence of the methane gas in their atmosphere. The methane absorbs the red wavelength from the incoming solar radiation and scatter back only blue light. And that is the reason why these two planets appear in shades of blue. Again, in these atmospheres of the giant planets, as I said before, there is a significant amount of hydrocarbon. I mean, hydrogen compounds, especially methane. And the presence of methane in this atmosphere initiate a very interesting chemistry, which we usually refer to as the methane photochemistry. We call it photochemistry because the chemistry is initiated when solar radiation, incoming solar radiation interacts with the uh, gas particles in this atmosphere. So once methane and the other gases in the atmospheres of this planet interact with the incoming solar radiation, a series of chemical reactions, complex chemical reactions, sets in. And what you ultimately get as the byproduct of this chemistry is very heavy hydrocarbon molecules, atoms, ions, uh, etc. And uh, in these atmospheres, especially in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, the temperatures are very low that these hydrocarbon compounds could condense into the form of clouds. 
that is you get to see hydrocarbon clouds in the atmospheres of jupiter and saturn and these hydrocarbon clouds forms very uh, interesting uh, circulation pattern in the atmospheres so we call this belt zone circulation so if you look into this picture of jupiter you can see something like a uh, stripes that appear on a child's ball hmm? there are regions of bright lines and uh, like slightly dim lines so this bright regions are usually referred to as belts and this dim regions are usually referred to as zones they are actually nothing but this clouds going around the planet so the sort of belt zone circulation is there in neptune as well and also in case of uh, uranus but they are not as evident as in the case of jupiter and saturn again this giant planet atmosphere holds uh, most of the dramatic weather phenomena most dramatic weather phenomena in our solar system you get to see lot of storms in the atmospheres of this giant planet so if you again come back coming back to this picture of jupiter you get to see this uh, red spot in its atmosphere this red spot is actually a very huge storm that is uh, uh, occurring at the southern hemisphere of jupiter and this storm is referred to as the giant red spot so it's so enormous in size you can actually fit in three earths into it with room to spare so you can imagine how big it is and uh, another interesting fact is that the storm has been going on for several centuries it is not dying out so why it is not dying out is because of the fact that as i said before this planets don't have a solid surface so we know in earth when hurricanes or storms forms uh, how do they die when they get onto the land due to the friction they lose their energy and finally they die out but in case of this giant planets there is no solid surface so because of this once the storms forms in the atmosphere they last for centuries so this giant red spot is a very large uh, storm that is occurring in the atmosphere of jupiter one such storm you can see in the atmosphere of neptune as well it is called the great dark spot so this sort of dramatic uh, storm events are occurring in the atmosphere of uh, uh, the giant planets which make uh, them a very dynamic system the atmosphere is a very dynamic system for the jovian planets again one more uh, aspect of the uh, jovian planets which uh, i would like to touch upon is the magnetic field of this planets so we all know that earth has got a magnetic field and this magnetic field look like uh, uh, the one created by a bar magnet so it's a dipolar magnetic field so similarly all the four giant planets also has got this magnetic field the difference is that their magnetic field is so much enormous or they are much much stronger as compared to the earth's magnetic field so here i have shown a table in which i have compared the strength of the uh, magnetic field of different giant planets with that of the earth and you can see jupiter is the champion the magnetic field strength of jupiter is around 20000 times larger than that of earth and how a planet generates a magnetic field i hope you might be knowing it is because of the presence of molten uh, magnetic material in its core so in case of earth we have this molten rock molten uh, iron core because of which we have a magnetic field around our planet in case of saturn and jupiter it is not the iron core it is because of the metallic hydrogen core that means in the inner core of the uh, planet the hydrogen is staying not in the gaseous form but in a metallic form it is something which you never get to see on our planet earth and this occurs because the pressure is enormously high in the inner region of this planet so that the gaseous hydrogen is compressed into the liquid form and it is this liquid hydrogen hydrogen which is causing the magnetic field uh, for the planet again because uh, in the liquid state what happens the electrons are not closely attached to the uh, nucleus so the electrons are free to move so electrons are free to move means what current is generated and when current occurs there will be a magnetic field so this is how the magnetic field forms around this giant planet again uranus and neptune also has got a, a magnetic field around it but in this case it is not the liquid um, hydrogen core which is creating this magnetic field instead it is uh, the core of the hydrogen compounds that is uh, causing the magnetic field 
and this uh, magnetic field creates uh, a space or a large cavity around the planet which we refer to as the magnetosphere so magnetic uh, magnetosphere is actually the region around a planet within which the magnetic field of the planet dominates over the magnetic field from the sun or we say the uh, planet's magnetic field dominates over the interplanetary magnetic field so here i have shown uh, the a comparison of the magnetospheres of the four giant planets and as you can see the jupiter has got the largest magnetosphere uh, within the giant planets which is obvious because it has got the strongest magnetic field and because of the presence of this magnetic field and magnetosphere around this planet you get to see auroras on this planet as well so you might uh, be already knowing how auroras are created on earth so it is because uh, earth is having a magnetic field around it around it so when charged particles are coming from the sun it uh, this charged particle enters into the earth's atmosphere to the through this magnetic field line and collides with the uh, atmosphere in the high latitude region so when this charged particles interact with the uh, gas particles in the atmosphere there occurs wonderful display of colors in the sky so that is why what is what we call as auroras isn't it so the same sort of thing happens in the atmosphere of giant planets itself there occurs auroras especially in case of jupiter and saturn you will get to see a lot of picture uh, in google if you uh, browse for auroras on jupiter and saturn so so far uh, we touched upon uh, the some of the interesting properties of the uh, giant planets in our solar system so how do we get to know uh, all this information about the giant planets so there are different methods for studying planets in our solar system isn't it we can do uh, telescopic observations or we can do theoretical studies like modeling and etc however the best way to study any planet is to send a spacecraft to the planet so let us uh, see which all spacecraft have visited uh, our giant planet so here i have shown a table in which i have listed the name of uh, uh, all those planets i'm sorry all those spacecrafts which have visited the giant planets of the solar system so as of now eight eight spacecraft have entered into the realm of the giant planets the voyager missions were flyby missions and this voyager missions made flybys with all the four giant planets jupiter saturn uranus and neptune and voyager had flybys with all these four giant planets and what is a flyby so flyby means the uh, spacecraft is not getting into an orbit around the planet but it just make a quick click of the planet as it is moving forward so that is what we call as a flyby but to have a detailed uh, study of a particular planet we need to have orbiters which are spacecraft which goes around uh, goes in orbit around the planet so coming to the orbiters uh, of this around this uh, giant planets we have we had three orbiters so one is galileo the next one is cassini and uh, the other one is juno so galileo and juno are missions uh, for studying jupiter so galileo mission got over and galileo had got a probe which was released into the jupiter's atmosphere so during through the uh, during its descent through the jupiter's atmosphere it made in situ measurements of the jupiter's atmospheric parameters again juno is again a mission for studying jupiter and it is currently operational so it is now currently it is going uh, uh, in orbits around jupiter making observations of the uh, jupiter's parameter and the cassini mission the cassini mission was actually a mission meant for studying saturn so we call it as cassini huygens mission so in huygens the this huygens actually indicates a probe so huygens was actually a probe which was released into the atmosphere of titan the saturnian moon titan and the titan just like the galileo's probe descended through the titan's atmosphere and made in situ measurements of the uh, parameters and uh, like there are upcoming missions like uh, juice juice is again another mission uh, which is designed for jupiter then there are missions for uh, outer solar system satellites like europa europa clipper which i already mentioned in previous slides uh, there is going to be another one which is called dragonfly which is again a mission for studying uh, uh, titan the satellite titan so these all are the missions uh, which have visited the outer solar system planets and which have uh, told us much secrets about uh, the outer solar system planets so now it is almost like uh, we discussed about uh, how we had two groups of planets in the solar system how they are why their composition is different and what are some interesting features of this planets 
now let us uh, see what lies beyond the uh, orbit of neptune so does our solar system end with neptune no it is not so beyond neptune you will get to see something called the cupia belt so cupia belt i show i have already shown this picture of cupia belt and root cloud in the first slide so cupia belt is like a, a big icy donut that is a, a line beyond the orbit of neptune and this cupia belt is composed of a large number of icy stuffs or icy particles which we refer to as cupia belt objects or kbos so you know pluto right so pluto is an example of a kbo so long back we used to consider pluto as a planet but it lost it lost uh, its uh, planetary status when scientists identified that pluto is just one among those lots of kbos that are going around the uh, uh, i mean draw going in orbit beyond the orbit of neptune and humanity have just started exploring this cupia belt and so far only two spacecraft have entered into the region of cupia belt one is the pioneer mission but the pioneer mission didn't make any observation of kbos and then we had this new horizons mission from nasa so new horizons was uh, a mission actually or well, not was it is still an ongoing mission so new horizon mission was designed for studying pluto and its satellite charon so pluto is a kbo as i had mentioned before so new horizons uh, made a detailed study of uh, the kbo pluto and is currently continuing its uh, uh, observations in the outer regions of our solar system now beyond the cupia belt actually i shouldn't say it's beyond the cupia belt there lies something else as well called oort cloud so oort cloud is something like a spherical shell that covers our entire uh, solar system so our solar system lies as if it is sitting inside a bubble created by this oort cloud so oort cloud again consists of many icy materials especially those of comets so you might have heard about long period comets so halley's comet uh, you might have already heard about it's a uh, long period comet so long period comets are those comets which take more than 200 uh, years to complete one orbit around uh, sun so this those sort of whole, uh, no, no, long period comets actually comes from this oort cloud so we actually uh, haven't made any physical observation of this oort cloud yet but uh, from uh, calculating the back trajectory of the long period clouds i mean long period comets which are visiting our inner solar system scientists guess that there should be a space like oort cloud from which this uh, comets are coming so this oort uh, cloud still remains as a partial mystery which needs to be explored further so with this uh, description of the oort cloud i come to the end of my presentation so it is like um, we have almost reached the farthest end of our solar system but uh, and remember this is like i have just touched upon many aspects of the outer solar system planets and there is much more things to explore uh, so my basic intention was to um, spark your interest so that you can delve into the further details of this outer solar system planets so keep exploring thank you